The following clip is from a book review and analysis video I made on Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman. The book explores the idea that our society has been transformed into a Huxleyan, not Orwellian, dystopia as a result of the television displacing the written word as our primary means of understanding ourselves. George Orwell wrote the famous novel 1984, which showcases a futuristic totalitarian surveillance state where people are controlled through force and fear. Big Brother, the state, watches and oppresses the people at all times. In the novel Brave New World, on the other hand, Aldous Huxley imagined that no such North Korean-style government would be necessary to oppress the future. Instead of people being controlled by force and fear, Huxley believed that people would be controlled by pleasure and entertainment. Truth and history would not be suppressed. They would simply be made irrelevant by titillating distractions. People would fall in love with technologies that would undo their capacity to think. Neil Postman argues that the television is the prime example of this technology. The following clip is an example of why Postman believes this is the case. Now the next passage I would like to read and discuss uh, comes on page 136, um, and there's something you should understand about this uh, particular passage uh, before reading it. Uh, there's a phrase called image politics in here, and essentially what Postman means by that is that uh, politics in the age of television has become not, uh, you know, about content or about positions or policies. It's become about image. What I'm saying is that just as the television commercial empties itself of authentic product information so that it can do its psychological work, image politics empties itself of authentic political substance for the same reason. It follows from this that history can play no significant role in image politics. For history is of value only to someone who takes seriously the notion that there are patterns in the past which may provide the present with nourishing traditions. The past is a world, Thomas Carlyle said, and not a void of gray haze. But he wrote this at a time when the book was the principal medium of serious public discourse. A book is all history. Everything about it takes one back in time, from the way it is produced, to its linear mode of exposition, to the fact that the past tense is its most comfortable form of address. As no other medium before or since, the book promotes the sense of a coherent and usable past. In a conversation of books history, as Carlyle understood it, it is not only a world, but a living world. It is the present that is shadowy. What Postman is beginning to argue here is that, um, you know, just given the way television is set up, uh, you know, and if a society uses television as its primary means of understanding itself, history is much less important to that society because history is much less important to the medium of television. Whereas history is fundamental to a book. Uh, just, it's all about what's already happened. Whereas a TV commercial about kids drinking Coke, that has, you know, that has no context uh, given to it as far as what time this is taking place. For all you know, that's happening right now. And you could have that Coke and be experiencing that now too. It's not that the television commercial has, uh, or, or TV culture uh, has obliterated history. It's just made it less important. Continuing along with that line of thought, let's uh, go ahead and read the next passage that also falls on page 136 and ends on page 137. Zesla Milos, winner of the 1980 Nobel Prize for Literature, remarked in his acceptance speech in Stockholm that our age is characterized by a refusal to remember. He cited, among other things, the staggering fact that there are now more than 100 books in print that deny the Holocaust, the Holocaust ever took place. The historian Karl Shortsky has, in my opinion, circled closer to the truth by noting that the modern mind has grown indifferent to history because history has become useless to it. In other words, it is not obstinacy or ignorance, but a sense of irrelevance that leads to the diminution of history. Television's Bill Moyers in inches still closer when he says, I worry that my own business helps to make this an anxious age of agitated amnesiacs. We Americans seem to know everything about the last 24 hours, but very little of the last 60 centuries or the last 60 years. Terence Moran, I believe, lands on the target in saying that with media whose structure is biased toward furnishing images and fragments, we are deprived of access to an, a historical perspective. 
In the absence of continuity and context, he says, bits of information cannot be integrated into an intelligent and consistent whole. We do not refuse to remember, neither do we find it exactly useless to remember. Rather, we are being rendered unfit to remember. I would say a lot of that rings true. I mean, it says, you know, uh, we are deprived of access to a historical perspective due to uh, a media uh, whose structure is biased towards furnishing images and fragments. Television is absolutely furnished towards images and frag fragments. I mean, people, uh, you know, think they can understand what's happening in the world in a 22-minute seg segment on Fox News or CNN. That's insane. It's insane that anyone thinks that they can understand the world in that amount of time, and yet we do. Those are all fragments of information that are just compiled together in a montage, and, and usually that information is wildly incomplete. Even when history is brought up in public discourse today, it is brought up in fragments. Like I remember this past summer, or summer before last in 2020, whenever uh, the George Floyd uh, protests and stuff was going on, a lot of people were like quoting Martin Luther King saying like, you know, a, li a riot is, a is the language of the unheard. But I was like, wait, that's one line in a giant speech. You can't use that as a reason to go out and break windows, you know? And I was like, what? what's the context of that line? And I, I haven't read the, the speech, but I bet it was uh, not, hey, you can go steal a television now. I bet that wasn't the purpose of that line. History books, they give you kind of a through line. There's a logic. There's whoever's writing that book has compiled information into a consistent whole that you can kind of understand. Um, and they spent years working on it, doing lots and lots of research, whereas an equal to that is not found on television. Now I'd like to read the next passage, which is uh, just down the page on 137. If these conjectures make sense, then in this Orwell was wrong once again, at least for the Western democracies. He envisioned the demolition of history, but believed that it would be accomplished by the state, that some equivalent of the Ministry of Truth would systematically banish inconvenient facts and destroy the records of the past. Certainly, this is the way of the Soviet Union, our modern-day Oceania. But as Huxley more accurately foretold it, nothing so crude as all that is required. Seemingly benign technologies devoted to providing the populace with a politics of image, instancy, and therapy may disappear history just as effectively, perhaps more permanently, and without objection. I like reading history books. I've, I, I'm a big fan of biographies and that sort of thing. I'm the only person I know that really does that. I mean, maybe I know one friend that likes to read history books and that sort of thing. But most people don't want to sit down, they want, don't want to take the time to read because reading is hard. And so effectively, history in America has been vanishing due to the fact that in order to actually have a good picture of history, that requires American citizens to do some hard work and research that they don't want to do. And in fact, they'd much rather just hang out with those seemingly benign technologies that devote themselves to a politics of image, instancy, and therapy.